All right. So uh, hopefully that's someone can tell me if that's working or not. Uh, Yasin, hopefully if it's not, I'll try to pay attention. Okay. It works, Professor. Okay. Gracias. All right. So you can be active on both or not active on both. So how can you be passive on both? So there's where it gets really, really simple. One of my favorite firms, Vanguard, not that I'm advertising them, but Vanguard, very impressive firm. You can go to personal investors. I don't want to log in. I just want to look and explore our resources, find your investment style. I don't want to do any of that. I just want to look at their funds. So let's look at balanced funds. I hate it when they keep changing their uh, website. What we offer. Mutual funds, finally. So the simplest thing to do and would actually be um, a pretty logical thing to do. Would you go in the Vanguard? Here's all their funds. They got a bunch of them. So let's do strategies. So they have when are you when are you going to retire? So you're 22 today. So you're going to retire in 50 years. So that's 2070. Do they have a 20? There's a 2070 fund. Right? Pretty easy. How much of your money would you put in there? Well, theoretically, you put your entire portfolio on there, 100 percent Does that sound is that bad diversification? Well, no, because what's what do you know about this fund? It's very well diversified. And what is this fund doing? So we'll look at um, portfolio composition. It's 54% in Vanguard stock market index fund. What is that? That's all US stocks. So what kind of stocks would be in there? US large cap growth, value, small cap value, small cap growth, mid cap. Um, high beta, low beta, it's just the entire US stock market. That's passive, isn't it? They're just buying everything. They have 36%, my word. That's a pretty bad allocation, isn't it? International stocks, that includes what? Developed and emerging, probably not frontier, but developed and emerging. 36%, boy, that is a, how's that done this year? Horrible and mainly why? Well, but mainly why, but specifically, I mean, it is inflation related, but the U.S. dollar, yeah, mainly the U.S. dollar. So that's done badly. Now, they do something I don't understand. They've got you 10% in bonds. I don't recommend that. If I were your age, I would just be 100% in stocks. I don't know why they do that 90-10. It seems like a waste for 2070. Their argument is risk, but I think we've talked about it before. I've never heard anyone say, hey, I'm so glad I did 90-10. I could have lost 38%. Instead, I only lost 36%. I don't know anyone out there that's excited they could have lost an extra 2%. But they will notice that they have that 10% in bonds when the stock market goes up 30%. That's kind of, they're going to fill that. But when this market drops, I mean, can you really tell between losing 30% and losing 33%? I mean, you just lose a lot of money, right? You don't, you don't say, wow, it could have been a little bit more. So... But this is a very passive fund. It's, these are all index. You even see the word index, don't you? Index, 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 index. What does index mean? Passive. So you could with one transaction. Very easy on Vanguard. You could sign up. They'll actually take the money out of your account electronically. You can do the whole thing online. And in one transaction, you would have your entire portfolio set up. How good would this do? I don't like their international allocation. But other than that, it's probably a pretty logical allocation to have. Um, you, I would probably do 100% stocks, but they've they've got it like that. But that's what they have. What are the fees on these things? This is Vanguard, so the fees are just absolutely ridiculously low. Um, there's their fee, eight basis points. 
that's that's nothing. You don't even notice that. In fact, you'll probably get all of that back. We'll talk later about securities lending. Vanguard does securities lending. That adds about 10, 10 basis points to the return. So you'll essentially get the market plus two basis points because you'll pay them eight, but they'll make 10. We'll talk about securities lending. So it it doesn't have to be rocket science here. Science here. You really can do this entire thing. I tell people I don't give advice, but if you want to go to Vanguard and buy one of their style funds, you're doing ex probably exactly what a financial planner is going to give you, but then you don't have to pay them the thousand dollars. You can just do it for free. So that's just my opinion, mainly because I trust Vanguard enormously, especially Jack Bogle. Unfortunately, he passed away, but I do recommend going to YouTube and listen to the interviews of Jack Bogle. He is he has been the conscience of our industry for the longest time, and he says the reason you buy index funds is because you save fees. His main thing is it's cheaper. He says that's the main reason passive beats active is because the fees are much, much lower. But had y'all heard of Jack Pogo before this class? How famous is he? A very, very highly respected man. I've only met him once, but I was shaking. While I was shaking his hand, you know, it's a scary guy, not because he's a scary man, he's a really nice guy, but he's just he's just such highly revered by our industry. Um, so he wrote a book called Don't Count on It. I don't recommend that book, just uh mainly because it wasn't a book. He just took all of his essays and stuck them into a book. So you read the same thing over and over again. So he probably could have just taken his best essay and just put that on the internet, but um and then Jones, John, James Montier, I do recommend his book, The Little Book of Behavior Finance. So if you want to be active on mutual funds, they give you three things that are the most important thing you got to do when looking at mutual funds. I then, in my job, I came in and when I became responsible for USA's mutual funds, I wanted to ask the question, how do you tell the difference between mutual funds that do well and want to do poorly? And I added two more things that I discovered. So if you want to talk to your family, let's, your parents probably have mutual funds and they probably don't know how they're doing. I, I've had people like in a year like this say, I get this mutual fund, it's just doing horribly. And I say, yeah, how do you know that? Well, it's down like 20%. I say, yeah, but the market's down 20%. I mean, he says, yeah, but I don't want to lose money. Yeah, but if you're in the stock market, you're going to lose money. Is that they think I should have picked a mutual fund that's me up this year. Yeah, you should put all your money in the Exxon. Um, so people don't really understand that relative trade. If, Let's say you go talk to your uh, your uncle and he says, yeah, I bought this U.S. stock fund and boy, it's doing horribly. It's like it's down like 10 percent this year. What would you tell him? You did great. What do you mean, uncle? You're down 10 percent. My word, the market's down over 20 percent. That's that sounds really you did a good job. So that's most most Americans don't even know what their mutual fund is doing. They just know they're losing money, but they don't know relative how much money they're losing or losing. Could be the other side, right? Hey, I'm making 20% on the stock market this year. Yeah, but market's up 30. You could have done a lot better if you just gone to Vanguard. So what Jack Bogan and James Montier say is number one is management fees. That's more important than anything else. And this isn't Ferrari versus Ford. We know a Ferrari is better than the Ford. And so that's why you pay more. And investing, paying more does not give you higher quality. In fact, paying more usually means you're going to earn you're going to do worse. So if we can, let's try. We did a Fidelity Contra Fund. So if you look at this fund, how much do they charge? We usually put management fees as basis points. I don't know why, but we usually express them as basis points. But they charge 86 basis points, so a little less than 1%. Their category average is 99 basis points. So just from the get-go, they're 13 basis points ahead. But Vanguard charges eight. So what advantage does Vanguard have? They're 78 ahead without even trying. So that means for Fidelity to beat Vanguard, they got they can't just beat by 10 bips, 15 bips. They got to beat by 78 just to tie. So that's a pretty hard standard for them to meet. So they're already having to catch up. The category is 99. Not only that, but there's some firms, funds that 
charge front end loads. 5.36%. So that means you start off, you give them 100,000 bucks, they take 5,000 of your money and you don't have it anymore. So in one second, you lose $5,000. Does that sound like a smart way to invest? <laughs> and then if you change your mind, take your money out, they take another 1,300 out. That's horrible. I remember my first big investing mistake was right out of college and I had one of these front end. I remember the salesman explaining it to me. I now think back and think how stupid was I? His argument was, well, we charge you up front, but we make it up over time. Well, no, you charge me up front and you charge a higher fee. You're never going to make it up. Your performance is no better than anybody else. You're just ripping me off because you pay these massive commissions to your sales force. So you would never hire a fund that charges these fees. So you got to watch out for the 12B1 fees. USA never did 12B1 fees. Those are kickbacks that's under the table. So you have some some somebody like Dave Ramsey or whoever who's pushing a mutual fund and then they give them a kickback for pushing their mutual fund. That's just another fee on top of another fee. You don't want to pay these fees. You know, if if someone's pushing Fidelity Contra and they're going to give them a 12B1 fee, you're better just to go to Fidelity and buy it yourself. Why have that middle person in between to do that for you? Um, so 86 is actually a little high, but, you know, for my taste, and again, we could do Vanguard. What did they choose? Ch charge three bips. <laughs> so they got an 85 basis points advantage over Fidelity. They haven't even started yet. All right, so it's Doesn't make sense. So you can see management fees are pretty important because they're very, very material. 75, 80, 100 basis points just at the get go. And that's every year. So you can't just do better. You have to do much better to make up for those fees. The second thing these guys discovered was turnover. So turnover is how often you trade stocks. You just hold on to them or do you trade them constantly? An index fund would have what kind of turnover, would you think? Very high or very low? Very, very low. The only time they have turnover is a stock leaves the index and another stock comes in. That's the only time they have to worry about turnover. So if you have turnover, not only are your fees expensive, but turnover, it costs you money too because the bid ask. Every time you trade a stock, you're losing money to the, the, the market because you got to pay them for trading the stock. It's not going to be massive, but it adds up. You do a lot of trades. So what they discovered is that funds with low turnover consistently outperform firms with high turnover. Fortunately, we can actually look at that number. It's provided. You all see it in there? There's the turnover for Vanguard, 4%. So that means... You know, if they have 100 stocks, they trade about four of them in a year. Now, the industry category, I don't know what that means. 5,000%. That's a pretty high number, isn't it? If we look at Fidelity, Fidelity's turnover is 27%. Not radically high, but definitely higher than Vanguard. So you've seen things you can do with your uncle's portfolio. Hey, let's look at your expense rate. Oh my word, you're paying 1.4%. Why are you paying such a high management fee? And look at the turnover, it's like 89%. You're paying this high fee and you know what, what are you doing? So you, I wouldn't suggest that because he might take you out of his will, but you're still giving him some good insight. So maybe do it in a more politically acceptable way. Um, So those are the first two. Those those make sense. Those are the easiest ones of all because they're so easy to look up, and they're probably the most important ones too. The third one, there's a study. So we know small investors make one huge mistake that destroys the returns. They sell winners too fast, and they hold on to losers too long. And it's all about ego. You buy a stock, it goes up ten percent. You sell it so you can brag about the gain you made. You buy a stock, and it falls twenty percent. You say, hey, when it gets back to what I bought it out, I'm going to sell it. It falls 30%. You say, you know what? I'm going to wait. It's going to come back. It falls 40%, 50%. Finally, you give up and you sell it at 50% loss. 
Um, and so there's a skewing with retail investors. Their realized gains are much smaller than their realized losses because of that ego thing. They sell their gains too fast. Well, what we discovered is professional managers, they do the same thing. And you can tell which ones are doing it by looking at their gain percentage versus their loss percentage. And you're looking for those that are balanced between those two. Unfortunately, there's no place to go look this number up. So you can't actually do this yourself. It'd be pretty, pretty difficult to do that. You do get the realized gains and losses on a mutual fund, but it's the net. So you don't really know how many were gains, how many were what was your percentage gains, what were your percentage losses. But if you could get that number, that would definitely be a good thing to look at. Um, and that's had a good, good, uh, good way of predicting. The two things I've discovered and other people know this as well. Have y'all heard of reversion to the mean? Did y'all talk about that in your stats class? If something's been above average for quite a while, what would be your forecast? That's probably going to be below average for a while. Just that re return to the mean. We see that in investing all the time. So if a fund has had a recent really strong performance, you don't know what they're going to do next, but they're more likely to be below average than above average. That's just the nature of it. I remember I had a boss who said, you know, Ron, we don't need to find the top 10% funds. That's too hard. Just give me the top 25, those that score in the top 25%. And I say, okay, I'll go look. So I went through thousands of mutual funds and I, I found 11 funds that were consistently in the top 25%. So I say, here they are. Here's the 11 funds. They've been consistently in the top 25%. He says, oh, great. Let's go invest with them. I said, well, there's just one caveat. If I had done this just purely randomly, I would have expected to have found 13 funds. If it's just pure randomness, there should have been 13. I found 11. So what does that tell you about those 11? Probably pure random luck that they were in the top 25%. Probably had, maybe some of them were great. But so if I if I was expecting 13, I found 20, maybe it says, okay, there's some in here that are really, really good. Some are lucky, some are really, really good, but we really don't know. Um, so you're actually better off, and this is not the way the industry works. This is why one of the things I really hate about this industry. What does the industry do? They come to you with their best performing funds. I, I've seen over and over again, Fidelity comes in, t Price Price and say, Here, here's the five funds we're pushing right now. And I'm like, well, why don't you, why aren't you pushing that fund? Well, they've had a, a rough two years. And I'm like, that's the, that's the one I want to look at. <laughs> They're the most likely one to do well. But why do they push me the three that done well? Why? Because it's easier to sell a fund that's done well recently than one that's done poorly. But what happens with the funds? They get a whole bunch of cash. They've now got to invest all that cash. It's going to destroy their performance. They used to be a $400 million fund. Now are down there a $1.6 billion fund. It's a lot harder to manage $1.6 billion than it is to manage $400 million. You start to hide your, hide your trades. So there is actually a reason for that. But could you talk your uncle into that? Hey, I got this fund. They've done really badly the last three years, but their 20-year record is really good. Um, would your uncle say, yeah, let me invest my money there? It's kind of tough to do, isn't it? But you'd actually be better off doing that than buying the fund that's done well the last three years. Especially the last three years, because what's done well the last three years? Those high-growth tech stocks. What have they done this year? They've blown up, so it would have worked. But so reversion to the mean, you actually are better off doing underperforming funds than outperforming funds. Now, it's not real predictable. I had my boss, I showed my boss a chart. You also do this when you get out. Um, I took thousands of mutual funds and I took one three-year period return and I graphed it against the next three-year period return. So like 2000 through 2002 versus 2003 through 2005. And I took their ranking for one three year and the next three year. If there was a relationship, you would see it a line going like that, right? If they were in the top 10% here, they would have been in the top 10% here. If it was negative relationship, you would say, hey, if they're top 10% here, they're in the 90th percent here. I did that chart. I wish I had kept that chart because it's a hilarious chart. It's just a bunch of darts, dots everywhere. And your stats class, what does that tell you the R square is? Dots everywhere, no pattern. The R squared is probably 0%. That means the last three years tells you nothing about the next three years, but the slope was negative, which means what? 
they ranked high this three-year period, they're more likely to rank low this three-year period. So it was a slightly negative slope, but it's not real strong. But at least tells you, you say ignore recent performance because it tells you nothing about how they're going to perform. Now that's real important because y'all saw that this fund has four stars on Morningstar. How many stars can you have? What's the best, y'all know? How high does that go? So five's your highest. How do you get five stars? Well, by having recent strong performance. So I had a guy in my department, I said, okay, Michael, Michael was incredible. He could run any numbers. He knew how to do lipper. He knew how to do fact set. So I said, okay, Michael, when a fund gets a four or five star rate ranking rating, what's their performance in the next three years? And what do you think he found? No relationship whatsoever. Two year, two year, two star funds, five year star funds, no difference. Three star funds, four star, it didn't matter. Two star funds did just as well as five star funds. There's one exception, and what haven't I mentioned yet? One star funds. You don't want to buy one star funds. They get shut down. They put their junior person on them. They go like it's done horribly. Um, so, but what you know, there's a lot of these CPAs that are starting their own financial planning departments. And what are they selling? They're selling four and five star funds. What does that mean? They're selling randoms. They would do just as well as they took out a dartboard. And how much are they getting paid for that? They're getting paid thousands of dollars to do something that sounds sophisticated. They're going out and finding these highly rated funds, but it has no better performance than they're throwing darts at a dartboard. Um, my other experience with was consulting firms. We went out and hop, interviewed. We did a request for proposal. The biggest consulting firms in the U.S. And all they do, their entire job, was to recommend managers to pension plans. And so one of the questions I added is once you recommend a manager, what is their performance going forward? And they all came back with, once you recommend a manager, the performance going forward averages 50%, which means they're right in the middle. Again, a dartboard. And you pay these managers, you pay these firms 300,000 bucks to bring you a list of uh, funds that have no better chance of outperforming than a dartboard. Why do you pay them 300,000 bucks? Well, you pay them 300,000 bucks because you don't want to be sued. Then if your fund underperforms, what do you say? Well, the consultant brought it to me. That's why committees do that. But they're no better than random change. Isn't that sad? <laughs> it tells you that you should probably do what? Go to Vanguard and buy an index fund. Because this is really hard stuff to do. Now, we had a guy from in our real estate company, a guy named Jonathan, very quantitative. And he said, hey, Ron, I, I want to come to your department for once one day a week. I'll work for you for free. My real estate company will pay for me. Guess what I said? I said, sure, come work. You know, you're going to turn down free labor. And this is what we asked them. Go out there and see if you can find anything that predicts the performance of mutual funds going forward. And he found two things, batting average and um, upside downside capture, which I'll talk about in my risk management class. So those are the only two things he found that had any statistical relationship. Um, and, and those are two really easy things to calculate. In my risk class, I show students how to actually calculate batting average and up and downside capture. Um, but they're not strong. It's not like you're going to win 80% of the time. You win like 53% of the time. You know, just barely above average. But I mean, 53 is pretty good if you're in the Major League Baseball, isn't it? If you could bat 0.53. So that's pretty good. Uh, but it's still not, you know, there's, there's no obvious, sure way to do it. Now, are there people out there that have figured it out? So who's the most famous one, probably? James Simons, have y'all heard of him? How many of y'all heard of James Simons? Nobody? I wouldn't call him Jim Simons. I don't know who calls him Jim Simons, but there he is right there. Um, he's still alive, I think. So he was at Renaissance. Just amazing the returns this guy got. Most people say there has to be something there. He's figured something out because not only was his returns just really good, but he was consistent, just amazing. Now he's a mathematician, so he's got some quantitative, quantitative approach that's over our heads. Did he find some secret, or was he lucky? We don't really know. But you would have been really happy if you had if he had invested with him. So he's he's someone you might want to read up on. 
unfortunately, he won't tell you what his strategy is. It's it's statistics, it's quant. He's trying to find patterns. Is he going to tell you what those patterns are? No way. Not only that, but he was doing so well, he finally said, you know what? Keep your money. I'm just going to invest my own money. I don't need your money. So that's how good he was. How many people do that? So you know what? You can pay me a fee, but I'm, no, I'm better off just managing my millions. So famous guy. If you want to look sophisticated, you know, get a James Simons t-shirt, walk around. So um, he's kind of your hero. So there are people out there. There's a few of them that have done really well. Bill Miller is a good example. Bill Miller has the record that he beat the S&P 500 15 years in a row. Just absolutely amazing. He was a value manager. You have to say, how in the world did a value manager beat the market 15 years in a row? Well, in 97, 98, he loaded up on tech stocks. And at the end of 99, he got out of tech stocks and moved to value stocks. Timed it perfectly. Does he have skills? There's a podcast with Bill Miller that I highly recommend. It's really exceptional. I was very, very impressed and I highly recommend you listen to that. But he had 15 great years and then he had three horrible years where he just absolutely blew up and did it. He got all these articles 15 years in a row. It's amazing. It's the most incredible investor in the world. Then he had three years. So the question is, was he lucky for 15 years? And then we found it out for three or was he really good for 15 years and unlucky for three years? And what he messed up in those three years is he loaded up on energy stocks and they came down. So he was right in 98, 99 on tech stocks, getting in and out of them, but he wasn't that smart on energy stocks. Does that mean he's stupid? No. Just because someone can't predict the future, I don't think that's stupid because he knows, you know, you're predicting energy stocks to do really badly in 2022. Well, maybe Putin might destroy that for you a little bit, right? You don't know these, you know, who's going to predict that Putin's going to attack Ukraine in December 2021, but maybe you could have. So you see what you're up against on, on these kind of things. The last thing, thing I discovered was manager longevity. So every time we, we always ranked ourselves against all of our competitors. And there was, you know, it was us and Fidelity and a few others. We're always like in the top four, top five but we kept switching positions. But there's one firm that was always number one. And y'all can guess who that is. Like that, who was always number one? Vanguard, always number one, over and over and over again. And I was like, why is Vanguard so good? And I said, I know what it is. It's those index funds with the low fees. So I said, Michael, again, Michael. Michael, take the index funds out and grade Vanguard again. Now guess who was number one? Vanguard. <laughs> And so I was asking, why is Vanguard so good? What do they do differently? Their, their active funds are cheaper, but what is the main thing? The main thing I found with Vanguard is how they manage their portfolio managers. Fidelity, T. World Price, USAA, if a manager had a few quarters of bad performance, they were fired and replaced. Vanguard, if a manager had a few quarters of bad performance, they stuck with them. They didn't switch. And we know that's true, right, with reversion to the mean. Everybody's going to have their bad day. If they're smart and they know what they're doing, keep them. You're probably going to fire them right when they're about to come back. And so, yeah, it was just so obvious. Vanguard did not replace their managers nearly as much as other managers. So I told my boss that. And he says, wow, that's really interesting. Now, when are y'all going to fire MFS? So he's like, what MFS? Yeah, they had a few quarters of bad performance. And everybody kept asking, when are you going to fire MFS? And we looked at this international stock manager and we like, you know, they they have done badly, but their long-term history is good. So we drug our feet, didn't fire them, and they ended up being our number one manager that year. So, you know, but everybody wanted us to fire them. Why? Because it's hard to talk about a manager that's done poorly. And we're not talking the last three years. They were talking the last three quarters. Fire them, get them out. They had a bad quarter. That's the way we think. We're so short-term. Why are we so short-term? And you get some of the cynicism. Jack Bogle says, why are we so short-term? It's because we're no longer portfolio managers, we're marketers. We're not managing money, we're selling product. And how do you sell a mutual fund? You sell it based on its recent performance. So we're not doing what the client needs, we're doing what we need to get their money. And even on the, on the uh, stars, let me give you, do y'all mind my cynicism? Is that all right? You don't like my cynicism, sorry. 
I'm not trying to discourage you from this industry. I'm actually trying to encourage you to radically change it because I think it's it's a mess. But we're looking at Fidelity, four stars. You must see a commercial from T. Rowe Price that says 80% of our funds are three, four, and five stars. Totally bogus. Why is that bogus? Because if they have a one or two star fund, what they do, let's say they have a two star small cap fund. That's bad, two stars. Well, they say, you know what? We're going to change the strategy from small cap to small and mid cap. And guess what happens? All of their history disappears. The stars go away. They no longer have a two star fund. And how much of their money they lose? No, they still got all your money. They're still making the management fee. The whole industry does that. So when you see those commercials, how many four and five star funds they have, it's totally bogus because they manage that. And it's really, you only have to change your strategy slightly and all your one and two star funds disappear. Does that sound ethical to you? Do you think we're tempted to do that at USAA? I had some two star funds. So, hey, can we change the strategy? We talked about it. We're like, that is just so unethical. We're just not going to do it. We're, we're not playing that game, but we could have. It been so easy to do. Um, so this industry is, I, I think, got some serious ethical issues. And so um, Derek and Luke are wondering if there's any industry you like, because they haven't heard me badmouth the life insurance industry. But um, when you're focused on sales and not providing pro a good product, you know, you, you make some really bad decisions. So of course, the, the Contra Fund is a really great fund. I like it. I love the strategy. I love the managers. They get a great history. Yeah, there's a lot to love about the Contra Fund, but it's expensive. Have they beaten the market? If you take my risk class, we, we do manage your attribution in there and you can figure out how to do that. It's, it's there. Any questions on this? Could y'all go? So Thanksgiving, you're going to see your uncle, right? Y'all all have that uncle or aunt um, or grandfather. That's probably the worst. It's probably a grandfather that's talking and grandmother probably does all the investing. And the grandfather just talks about what she did and doesn't even know. But let's say you meet your grandmother. She does all this investing. Could you use this list to sit down with her? The first thing you do is what? What do you actually own? What asset allocation you have? Oh, you have all your money in tech stocks. Okay, that may be an issue. Second question is, hey, what's the management fee you're paying on this thing? That'd be a good question to ask, wouldn't it? Um, what's the turnover? You could do that. What's their recent performance been? You, know, you could sit down and do some pretty sophisticated stuff just with this one list. Now, should you take her money and invest it for her? Probably not. You may be not ready to do that, but you could you could probably intelligently help her understand what she's doing as an investor. I would think. So, questions on this? Should I add something else to the list? Do you care about the name of the fund? I've been working with this, mentoring this high school kid and he's coming with, and he just came up with really two cool names for mutual funds he's gonna create on paper. Would that influence you? Do you care about a star power? There's some mutual funds that are run by famous star people. Does that influence you? Or would you rather have a committee group so listen to Bill Miller. I mean, I, I think that's important. You listen to Bill Miller and he sounds like, wow, that sounds like that would work. That sounds like that strategy would actually work. That, I think that's it. That's not a bad way to do it. Bill Miller is definitely a star manager. Um, but Bill Miller is getting up there in age. So it's a good chance he's not making the decisions. It's probably his staff. The one reason I didn't hire his fund is we didn't interview him. We interviewed his staff and it was a bunch of young, young people that had not that much experience and they were saying all the just cookie cutter stuff i wanted to hear the stuff bill miller is saying the, the true strategy we run so you know you've got to decide how you're going to invest this now you're going to have a 401k plan your 401k plan is going to have management fees it's going to have turnover it's going to have recent performance it's going to have managers it's the exact same analysis you got to do it's just you got to figure it out yourself because it's going to be buried somewhere in some website somewhere you got to find it so no questions on that. Y'all got it? All right. So if you're going to do security selection, that's regulated by the 1933 Securities Act. Here's where you hire a broker. We're going to be doing that in the class I'm teaching on Fridays. We're getting next couple of weeks. We're going to start setting up how to actually do trades. 
So hopefully you have a brokerage account and you're doing some trades now. You hire a broker. Who's your broker? Uh, could be uh, Robinhood, could be uh, uh, Swab, TD American Trade, Ameritrade. Um, there's several of them. Who's the best? Don't ask me. I have no clue. I really don't. My whole career as a stock investor was we had a trade desk. So I just took a trade ticket to um, the trade disc and they did whatever they did. So I'm totally un untrained in that area. Um, but who's the best? It's it's more than the fees they charge. It's actually execution. And you got to worry about a Robin Hood because what's Robin Robinhood going to do with your trades? They're going to share it with somebody else so that they can bet against you. So you have to be careful. They're taking your trades and selling your trades as information to somebody else. So you, you know, you have to be careful. Why is it free? Well, it's not really free. They're making money by, you know, it's kind of Facebook, isn't it? <laughs> or Meta. Meta's free, except for what? They're sharing all your information with advertisers. That's what these free trades are doing. They're selling your information to somebody else. Brokers now are are moving electronically. And it amazes me how fast trades happen. I put a trade in and it's executed like in a nanosecond you go you know they have this button that says you know look at uh the status of your trade as if you know you you know it's still in the works still in the works but no you click on that and it's already happened it's already gone if you haven't traded you got to go trade set up an account even if it's paper money set up an account and start doing trading i might do some trades in here we'll see i did a trade today but um the markets are closed so i don't know why i'm looking at that clock uh, <clears throat> You also have over-the-counter trades, which you probably won't do for a while, but that's for the markets where it's very, very illiquid. You actually have to find the inventory. So you want to buy a bond, maybe you want to buy a five-year bond where you loan money to IBM. You got to go find who has that in inventory. Bond markets don't work like stock markets. You don't just put in a trade and they execute. You got to go find them. You can do munis, but even munis are not the same way. They're, they're, they tend to be... Uh, very illiquid. Bond markets tend to trade in massive amounts. USA, they were doing hundred million dollar, multi hundred million dollar trades at once. You, you trade, you know, this is a twenty billion dollar portfolio. They're going to trade. They're not going to trade at a million dollars each. You just, you'd be trading them you know, too many times all day. So you're going to go buy hundred million of this, two hundred million of that kind of thing. They're massive. So you're probably not going to buy corporate bonds. You're probably going to buy mutual funds that own bonds. That's much more likely. Same thing on munis. Um, they these over-the-counter OTC. You have a sophisticated buyer, sophisticated seller. They're not as regulated quite as tightly as other markets. They're very illiquid securities. Now, treasuries. You can buy treasuries if you go to Treasury Direct. It still doesn't feel the same as buying stocks. It's still a little bit different feel to it. You've got to set it up and get it working on the same thing with government agency bonds, mortgage-backed securities. You can buy all those things. But I think for most of you, you're probably going to do those through a mutual fund. It's just a lot more efficient, a lot easier to do, um, but especially corporate bonds. You're not going to buy $10,000 of corporate bonds, but you can't put $10,000 into a corporate bond mutual fund. All right, there's the 33 Act. Um, what trades can you do if you set up your brokerage account? So maybe I'll maybe I can do this. Maybe not on Thursday. We'll see. Um, boy, I wish our class. Yeah. If we did the beginning of class, we started at two thirty. So I have just enough time to do a trade, don't I? So maybe I should do a trade. Maybe I'll do a trade in my mom's account. We'll see. Um, I don't care if y'all see how much money she has. Um, so I could do a market order which says, "Hey, whatever the going price is, just give me that price." That's going to execute really, really fast. You do a market order and you'll usually get pretty close what the last price is. If you do a limit order or stop loss order, that's where you have to put in a number there. So yeah, it's probably gonna be too slow to do that. So we'll start there next time. So stocks overall, overweight stocks, as we expect strong economy, that sounds good. Definitely very, very positive. Treasury bonds duration, short duration during the rates rising. Sounds good. Quality moved down as, as economy strengthens. Sounds good. Underweight tapes, that's inflation, not a concern. Y'all tell me if you're not up there. MBS, underweight and by convexity. 
due to more volatility. Okay, I'll give you that. See, I don't, I'm not all that picky on the wording. Now, in the interview, you can't say that, right? You got to flesh it out more, but on the exam, that's fine. Muni's overweight medium quality, but prefer lower because... Overweight short term due to rising interest rates. Overweight muting since yields are 3.43. Now I heard one team using the 25s, so be careful. You, you always use the marginal on this. All right. I might wait, I don't know why I'm doing it like that, but one, two, three, four, five. I might give you 0.9 on this. What are they missing here? This last one only applies to what? Muni's versus corporates. They should have said that. So on that bullet, make sure you're saying Muni's versus corporates. Okay, that makes sense. Team one, so 0.9 there. Oh, wait. Yeah, I agree with that. I'll give you one more there. Within stocks, we will underweight large cap due to the economy strengthening. Underwrite lower beta and prefer cyclical stocks to the strong economy. And then now here you could really combine them. So within stocks, because I gave you low beta, high betas, I, I usually won't do that. I don't have any value growth in here. What would you be buying in here? Value or growth? Value, you want lower quality. So I didn't give you that one, but okay. Within stocks, we'll overweight. Now here you don't really need within stocks because you're going to overweight small cap either way, but that, that's fine. Overweight high beta. So develop underweight markets prefer U.S. dollar because it is stronger. So there's the dollar. I'm not sure what I mean. Other countries are falling. Got to be a little clear on that. What do I mean? Other countries. What other countries? Yeah, be a little clear on that. That's a little ambiguous. So other com countries, I don't. It almost sounds like underweight developed markets because other countries besides developed markets are falling and that would be like the exact opposite so so be a, be a little clear on that they're doing pretty well though emerging overweight due to emerging markets bouncing back very strongly then alternatives well you could go all the way over here you don't need what what's one of the big things on alternative is inflation do you need that no inflation protection so gold is not going to do well here Strong dollar, no inflation, golds. So you could say that, that they all talk about gold. Do you need diversification? Usually in strong economies, you don't want diversification. Just throw in everything in stocks and go for the ride. So, so what could you think? You could say the negative. Don't, the, go, you don't need gold in this environment with weak inflation and strengthening dollar. You could definitely say that. So you get a point there. Um, so they 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 talk about that here. So I would give them a point there. Overweight commodities on tourism for diversification due to strong economy. I'm not sure on that one. Um, I'm not sure what what could you say. You might say some commodities. There are economy. There are commodities because what kind of products are consumers buying? Staples are durables. What did it say at the beginning there? Higher end, what, what's a higher end product? Huh? Durable. Durable. So what's a good durable you would buy? Cars. cars. What do cars need? Steel, rubber. All right. Now what about real estate? Higher interest rates, maybe not. So it could be some there. So I think they did really, really well there. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14.7, does that sound right? If I did it right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 12, 13, 14, oh, 15.7. 15.7, that sound right? That sounds like a really good score. Plus 15.7 divided by 17, yeah, 92. You could do better, <laughs> but 92 is pretty good. All right, good. Give them a hand. I think I'm All right, so one other thing to remember is um, it's not a team question. All right, I've had students walk in. Hey, I thought it was a team question. It's not a team question. You got to do it yourself on Tuesday. So you'll, you'll have 30 minutes, so make sure you don't 
don't waste time because we had all stop after 30 minutes. Um, but you see what it is, 17 items, maybe 18, depends on what I give you on alternatives, but definitely those 17, all right? Any questions on that? I don't know what I'm gonna give you, whether it's gonna be positive or negative. You see they're getting a little redundant because I have to keep it somewhat consistent. So they're a little strange. And we're in a really strange environment now where things are really, really out of whack. But the inflation's always a tough thing. You see why we hate inflation so much as investors, because it's it's just really tough to figure out. You could see a scenario. So we saw today inflation and we got a strong market reaction. Last week we saw a strong employment report and we got a really negative reaction. Who knows? But what do you think is going to happen when uh, an inflation number surprises at 6.2%? What are markets going to do? Talking about a massive rally, aren't you? When you finally say, hey, inflation's coming down. Now, today they're supposed to announce the Social Security inflation. Have y'all seen that yet? My mom's on Social Security, so I'm hoping. Um, so if, yeah, if, I'm curious if they've announced that yet. Are they really going to increase Social Security 8%? When's the last time Social Security recipients got an 8% raise? That's been <laughs> probably since the 70s. So that would be pretty incredible. All right, y'all got it? Any any final questions? One thing I want to do before we talk the notes is I'm just going to hit paper two. I don't think you should worry about it until after the exam, but I just want you to start thinking about it. I like paper two because it's extremely real life. In fact, uh, one of the students, I think, yeah, it was. Um, Oh, Juan Carlos, he was talking last night in Investment Society about his intern, and this is one of the things he did, exactly this. He looked at the portfolio, who's reporting, let me write a paper. So he had to actually write paper too in his internship. So what if you get that internship and they ask you to do that? It's like a piece of cake, I've already done it, I know exactly what I'm doing. So you got plenty, you got about, a, about three weeks to do it. I say select a company, I'm going to decide whether you select a company or I'll give you a list of companies. Because you want, you want something you can write about. You don't want a company is expecting $2 in earnings and they reported $2 in a penny. All right. So I'm looking for firms. And if you see one, let me know. I'm looking for a firm that reports and their stock price goes wild. They reported $4. They're expecting $3. Their stock is up 40%. Far more interesting is a firm beats. They're expecting $2 and made two thirty, dollars and their stock price crashes. That's the more interesting story. Um, and there are a lot of those. In fact, 40% of the time, that's the way it's like. A firm beats, their stock goes down, a firm misses, and their stock goes up. So 40% of the time you get these, it makes it much more interesting to write about because you're like, wow, what happened? Why is the market reacting like that? It could be they beat on earnings, but they missed on revenue. What if Uber says we're going to have 200,000 new customers and they only get 150? Yeah, that's that's an important miss for them, or Uber the same way, All right? So you select or I'll select the company that you can pick from. Um, you're going to read articles. So you're looking for the earnings announcements so that you can't pick anything because it has to be a firm that reports sometime in October. All right. So I'm going to be watching and seeing. You can start watch your you can start watching yourself. I just do corporate earning corporate earnings. Um Uh, boy, I don't like, I like Google better. Let's see if I can find it. No, not Google's earnings, but well, we can look at Yahoo Finance. I don't like theirs the way they do it. But anyway, so Alliance Bernstein is reporting. Blade Air, I have no idea who they are. All the banks are reporting tomorrow. So banks are interesting. Yeah. yeah, we'll look at them. So this firm was expected to lose money and they made money. How do you think their stock is doing? BLDE. You think it's up? You would expect it to be up, and their stock is down. But yeah, it's it's down. How can a stock that was expected to lose money instead made money? Their stock be down. So that'd be interesting. I have no idea who this company is. Blade Air Mobility. Boy, that's um, y'all know this company. Provides air transportation alternatives to the congested ground routes in the United States. So it's like a, a taxi air. So, you know, y'all use this all the time, right? You need to get 
across San Antonio. I was like, hey, I'll just take a helicopter, save me some time, 500 bucks, but I saved 20 minutes, might as well do it. Um, so we're probably gonna do larger companies. Here's a firm that Beacon Roofing Supply beat by 6%. So I'm looking for firms that is interesting and the stock moved a bunch. In fact, the stock moving a bunch is probably the main thing I'm looking for. I'm looking, I'm looking for stocks that move four, five, six, seven percent. But what if I find a stock that moves three percent and the market's up four percent? Did the stock do well? No. So we're have to look. So I might see a stock, wow, their stock's up a bunch, but it's a day when the stock market's up a bunch. It may not be the earnings report that did it. So there's ones coming out. I don't recognize most of these companies. So um, Friday, 16 are coming out. Our Alliance Bernstein is actually pretty interesting. Um, Wells Fargo, yeah, a bunch of banks tomorrow. So we'll see if any of them report. Interesting thing. There's another one. United Health would be an interesting one. I don't know them. Morgan Stanley. So yeah, you're right. Tomorrow's a huge day. And then next week, Monday's a huge day, Tuesday's a huge day. So I'll just be looking through here to see. So what are you writing? So very similar to what you did in paper one, what was expected, what actually came out, all right? It's possible there's some adjustments and we'll talk a little bit about that when we look at some of the companies. A lot of companies that report two bucks and they made, you know, they're expected 230 or whatever, Sometimes it says they reported 230, but it was $3 after they adjusted for something. And I have seen those. I remember the biggest one I can remember is Best Buy. There was one time Best Buy reported earnings with like negative $4, but the adjusted number was like positive $2. They had some major massive write-off that the markets. And what does the market look at? They look at adjusted. So we're gonna focus on adjusted. But who's adjustments? You can have three or four different adjustments. So we're going to use one source, which is going to be Bloomberg. Bloomberg is going to be our source. So we have one common source. So everybody has the same numbers. All right. But it is possible when you read articles that what I'm saying the adjusted number is is different than what the article says, because there are different ways people adjust these numbers. The so same thing on expected. I'm going to use Bloomberg for the adjusted and Bloomberg for the expected. It's possible you'll read an article where you get a different number because there's different people making forecasts. And you're going to look at it not last quarter, but last quarter a year ago. That's just the way we do it. Because of seasonality, you don't want to compare second quarter to the first quarter. You want to compare second quarter 2022 to second quarter 2021. Right? This year is not going to be an issue. What happened last year? We're comparing second quarter 2021 to second quarter 2020 anything big going on back then that would be pretty huge right zoom probably looked miserable no who knows um and walmart some of these stocks actually did worse then you have top line growth revenue growth you always see that in the articles they beat on revenues but they missed on earnings or they beat on earnings but they missed on revenue and sometimes the market reacts more to revenue than it does to earnings same thing on revenue what did they report? What was expected? What was it same quarter last year? All right. Then the bottom line. That's where we look at margin. I'm going to help you with that. We'll, we'll look. I'll bring in the numbers from Bloomberg, both gross and net margin. Um, why would gross margin be really, really important right now? Anybody have any ideas on that? What's going on that might make a gross margin important? We just talked about it earlier. Inflation, maybe? What's the big question on inflation? We saw the PPI earlier. The PPI was up a bunch. That's what it's going to be cost of goods sold. So the question is, okay, our cost of goods sold are going up. Can we pass that on to the customer or not? If you can't, what happens? Your gross margin is going to shrink. If you can, your gross margin stays the same. All right. And then net margin is it's kind of the flow through gross margin and all your other expenses. And we'll look at that. I don't know if I'll use EBIT or EBITDA. It kind of depends on the company. And then you're looking to see, can you find anything that management is saying? That's interesting. One thing you can do, I don't know if how many of y'all have done this, but the earnings call. conference call, have any of y'all sat through one of those before? Boring as can all be until you get to the end and the analysts start asking questions. But you can get to those. They're usually on the website for the company 
a recording that you can listen to. Sometimes they have a transcript. Bloomberg has a transcript, but it's a transcript that the computer does, and the computer is not too bright. And boy, there's a lot of typos, a lot of words that don't make any sense. So you're you're gonna have to try to figure that out. Sometimes I can't even tell what it's about. It's a word that just doesn't make sense. I would encourage you to use this as an excuse to listen. You want to have have listened to at least one before you start interviewing. So you can you know that exists, what they're about. You know, it's hard to talk to something in an interview if you don't really know what it's like. Just listen to one. I know it's boring for an hour, especially the company itself makes it boring because they don't want to excite people. You know, they, the CFO comes in and everything, oh, everything's normal. Yeah, our earnings are down 87%. Yeah, you know, they make it sound blase and they're all panicking. Um, now, who's on the conference call besides management? Analysts, but which analysts? Sell side or buy side? Sell side, but legally, buy side can't be on these calls. Only the sell side. The sell side can't buy the stocks. They only give uh, advice and analysis. But I was asking, talking to some sell side analysts, and I asked them, "Hey, you as a sell side analyst, you're going to be on the conference call." Does the buy side ever come to you and say, hey, make sure you ask these questions? Like, yeah, yeah, that happens. Some of my customers would come and say, hey, can you make sure to ask them about that new plant they're opening opening in wherever? So it's the sell side analyst. The nice thing about this is they also write reports. So you have on UTSA library, you have Merchant Online. Merchant Online has these sell side analyst reports. It a firm reports earnings like October 3rd, there's a good chance there'll be a sales side report like October 20th. That'd be great information for you to help you on this paper because do you think the sell side analyst knows the company better than you do? Probably so, unless you know you, your last name is the same name as the company, it's unlikely if unless you have some kind of inside information. So there's a lot of resources there. And then the other, the next part you're going to do is the stock market reaction. By stock market reaction, I mean the stock price of your stock. I've had some students talk about the S&P, but you got to talk about your particular company. You can bring the S&P in because it's important. You know, if the S&P is down 2% and your stock's up 5%, yeah, that's pretty, pretty amazing. Now, we can see the day. Boy, I'm, I'm kind of curious on Finviz. What do you think Finviz is? Day green or red? All green. Ah, Amazon. How can Amazon be down today? That's pretty amazing. But yeah, it's it's pretty. I don't know who that is. Boy, now service now. I don't know who that is. A big company though. There's a few that are down, but not very many. Um. Now, why would Amazon be down when everything else is up? If maybe they reported earnings. I don't think they did, but. Or maybe there's some news. There could be specific news to Amazon. Who knows? But Amazon, and it's not that you say, well, they're not down much. But if the market's up almost 3%, not being up at all is a big miss. So they're off quite a bit. Microsoft's up a bunch. Apple's up a bunch. Um, MasterCard's up. The pharmacies are up. No telling why they're all up. They make money no matter what. Huh? Can I ask a question about this chart? Okay. It seems we saw uh, a lot of these banks are uh, reporting their earnings tomorrow. And on the bottom left, you will see that, yeah, it's done that right. JPM, Bank of America, Los Fargo, they all have at least about 5% increase right. before the earnings. It doesn't, doesn't mean that most investors are buying their stocks before earning in hopes of good news or. It might be, but I think also today was a big was a big day for bank information because of the the CPI number. So it could be, it also could just be that they're, you know, it's, it's the economic data because we did get big economic data today. Yeah, they're all, that's that's a really strong day for them. Um, I don't know why they have MasterCard and Visa. MasterCard and Visa are not financials. They're technology companies. Right. <laughs> if you don't pay your credit card bill, how much does MasterCard lose? Nothing, they don't care. Bank of America might care, but Visa Max are they make they make money off of you when you buy the stuff. After that, they don't care. Pay your bill or not, doesn't matter to them. I mean, they may like for you to pay your bill because it makes the card a little more valuable. But um, all right, so we'll talk about that here. So here you want to look up management says, what other analysts are saying, what journalists are saying. 
You know, you're looking for articles. Bloomberg is a great source. This is paper two is a paper. You could write the entire paper sitting at a Bloomberg machine for about three or four hours, have a really good draft because it's all there on Bloomberg. Bloomberg is set up to do this and they have a lot of resources, but I'll, I'll help you through then do that. So this is a really, really good paper, um, good practical paper, something you might actually do in your first job. This is a pretty common thing to give to uh, interns. And the reason I like to do this with interns is it's simple. So think about it. you're showing up as an intern and they're assuming you don't know anything. They don't know. I mean, you're from UTSA, so you do, but the students from other schools don't know anything. And they're like, all right, I don't have time to train this person. If I spend time training them, they're gone in three months anyway. So that's a waste of time. What's well, the simplest thing I can give them? Oh, let give them a list of our stocks. If any of them reporting earnings, go look and see what they did and give them reports. So it's a simple thing you would know what to do. Most, you know, be pretty, most students can figure that out. Go look things up or go ask somebody. So it's not that uncommon of a report. Right, we'll talk about this more as we get closer, but I want to show it now so you start thinking about it. But also, if you see a firm you're really interested in, then you know, let me know. I'll start looking for it. Look at the, the earnings list and see what, uh, especially, uh, wow, look at next Wednesday. It's just going to be massive uh, if there's any big companies. What I don't like about Yahoo Finance that I think Google has is the market cap. That way I can find the big companies and I don't know who's, who's there. I need to look at um, Bloomberg and see. I don't see any. Well, there's Snap. Expect it to lose money. Wow. Oh, Snap Own. That's probably what I was thinking of. Um, if y'all see a company that's interesting, Nucor would be interesting. Intel, that could be interesting. Semiconductors have been huge in the news. What did Biden do? Doesn't his bill try to bring more semiconductors to the US? Is that positive for Intel? Or is that in their numbers? Intel is trying to get in, uh, expand to other things. There's a lot of things going on with them. Baker Hughes, are all prices down or up today? Well, prices are up to 89, still below 100. So Baker Hughes could be interesting. PAS is not important. Where's that? Under the timing of the, the report. You see that? Uh, some of them are before market and some of them are PAS. Well, they, just, they may just not know. Oh. Uh, and know. just management decides. We're going to talk about this, whether it's before or after market makes a big difference because that's going to tell you what stock price you're looking at. So if they report before market, you look at yesterday's price versus open today. They report after market, you look at close today versus tomorrow's open because you can't look at a stock price. if You have to look at a stock price right before the, the last one you have before the report and the first price after the report. And then you always look at close for the when after the report. So we'll look at that. That's important as well. All right, so fun paper. I'm kind of jealous. Y'all get to write this. I always, I like writing these kind of papers. The reason I like this paper is it gives you some good creativity. You really can go and do some extra analysis and find some really cool stuff, aren't you? Um, so I think after the first thing is that people tend to be worried in second for their reason. Uh, no, I, I, I think I meant. I can't remember what I actually said, but that people do really well. They do well in the first paper, do really poorly on the exam. It's the exam because the exam is so different. Um, and I think some students study for the exam like it was a multiple choice exam. How would that work if you, multi you try to study this for this exam as if it were a multiple choice exam? It'd be a disaster, wouldn't it? So, yeah, no, I think that's what I meant. Yeah, paper two tends to do okay. The papers tend to be much higher than the exams in this class. Um, the papers you can put on LinkedIn, though, so, you know, it gives you that, it gives you something that you can put out there. We were, in a meeting on Tuesday with Oliver Wyman. And I asked them, what do you want to see from students? And they said, communication, communication. And I said, what kind of communication? Written or oral? And he said, yes. <laughs> so we want to see papers that they've written. So take all the papers from all the classes and find your best ones. Right? Hopefully it's not just this class. You've got other classes with papers and you can put those out there. And then what we do with the Investor Society is if you you know become a leader there, you can do a presentation. We got videos, you can take those videos. We've had students do that. So 
you know, try to find something. Or if you're doing a presentation to a class, ask the teacher if you can film it so you have something to show. They just want to know that you can communicate. All right, so market order is pretty common. I, I like market orders mainly because I don't have time to mess with it. So I'm like, I like the stock. I want to buy it. Just give it, give it, give me the stock. I don't usually have really precise numbers. One thing I'll say on limit orders is be careful with really round numbers. So if you want to buy Uber at 25, I'm going to buy it, put my limit order at 2504. Look at the bid ask and, you know, I, I might go a little above that. Round numbers sometimes escape you forever, especially if you're a trader off of patterns and you think they're support at 25. You think it's going to bounce off of 25. You put exactly 25 in there. There's a good chance it's not going to get there because you don't buy at 25. You buy at the higher price uh, between the bid ask where you're buying or selling. So you might say 2505, 2507, something so that you make sure it ex executes. But a limit order is if you're buying, you put in a lower amount. So you're saying, I don't want it right now, but if it falls at this, I want it. If you're selling, you put in a higher price. I don't want to sell it right now, but if it hits this price, sell it. A lot of times people that do a lot of um, uh, kind of charting type of trades where they, they see the stocks trading in this range, they'll say, hey, buy here, sell there, buy here, sell here kind of thing. And in a stop loss is just, hey, if it hits this, sell it. Now, I don't believe in stop losses. I believe in using options. We'll talk about how you can use options to do a far superior stop loss. And you can use options actually to do better limit orders as well. So you don't have to do limit orders. You can use options so that you get paid to do limit orders. And we'll talk about that later in class. It's a really effective strategy. So um, I say, if you're going to do a limit order, don't do a limit order. Use the option market to do that for you. Uh, now, if you select your own securities and you're going to do your own trades, you're competing with people who've been do, who do this 50, 60 hours a week. This is really tough stuff. Um, how many stocks can you really keep track of? So in the investment society, we show you how to take the market, get down to a buy list, and then analyze that and get down to the actual stocks you're going to buy. But it takes us two semesters to do that. Um, and even then, we don't have great confidence because we really don't have that much time. You know, we're, we're spending 45 minutes a week on something these people are spending 50, 60, 70 hours a week on. So it's kind of tough. I've spoken to a couple of um, investment clubs. Uh, the second one I've spoke to um, in the last few years, well, it's been a while, boy. Uh, the first one, they were just really confident. We got it all figured out. I don't know why they invited me. They didn't care what I had to say. So I said, okay, fine, you got it all figured out. The second one, they, hadn't, they didn't have a clue. And so I came in, I told them, this is what you need to do. And they said, thank you very much. And so I called uh, my friend and said, hey, what did y'all decide to do? Um, we're now a gardening club. Said, okay, great. I guess I talked them out of it. So um, other groups, it just depends. Some people are, they're, they're wed to a certain, so they saw some guru on TV or on the internet and they're just following their approach. I can't really help them much because I can't sit down and test to see whether that particular strategy works or not. I had one student, you know how they, well, I don't have a TV anymore. I don't know that they do this, but the, you, you go to the Holiday Inn hotel lobby or whatever, conference room they're going to give you this trading model that you can use i had one student go and check that out and he brought it back and he, was, he said yeah it's pretty pretty basic stuff um so is there a strategy out there that that you can find that's going to work and be successful when you're competing against people with two mit degrees spending 60 hours a week with massive computer resources if you think you can beat them then you've got some really good confidence you might have other things as well, but you have good confidence. This is what I've actually heard. I heard a commercial that said this. This should make you mad. This is this is a direct quote. Anyone with a fifth grade education can trade like the professionals on Wall Street. Do you believe that? That was in a commercial TV commercial. How often do you hear those commercials? When's the last time you heard someone say, anyone with a fifth grade education can take their kids' appendix out like the, the 
best doctors at Mayo Clinic can. Have you heard that commercial lately? Why does why is the TV channel saying uh, we finance people really aren't of that skill? What we're doing is really simple, really easy. All I got to do is give you the software package. You got a fifth grade education. You can do as well as they do. You heard that on how anybody with fifth grade education can build a, a 50 story building like the uh, best construction people out there. You don't hear that. Can you think of another profession that says that? Are we the only profession that says that? Doctors, construction, plumbers, the plumbers say that? You don't need a plumber. I was talking to my plumber. He was fixing the drain. I said, you know, is there something I could buy to do this myself? Oh, no, no, it'd be really dangerous. So he's, like, Man, he's probably lying to me. I don't know, but I'm not going to chance it. But yeah, for some reason in finance, what we're doing is so simple. So why do they pay us so much? How many fifth graders, people without a fifth grade education are making $700,000 a year with $500,000 bonuses? So there's, is there a problem here, right? There's some disconnect here. So what is it? Is are we overpaid, or is this are this sentence wrong? We have all these finest people out there with no skills that are making six, seven digit salaries, and they don't know much. Are are the commercials wrong? So if I were you, I'd be mad when I hear this. But it's out there. So anyway, and none of you are answering that question, so you, you had to think about it. But pretty common. So, um, and then how do you know if you're actually doing a good job or if your broker or your investor is doing a good job? Uh, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about return. But I remember I've told this story a few times. So I hope I haven't told it here yet. But I went my first trip to Europe. We went to the uh, Olympics as spectators. And one of the people on the trip never met him before. He heard I was an investment guy. He's like, oh, so excited to meet me. When I talk investments, say, hey, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says, and I've got the greatest broker ever. I said, yeah, how do you know? I ruined the entire rest of his trip. He was like stressing out, how do I know? And he said, well, he calls me with trades. I said, yeah, that makes him money. How do you know he's making you money? Ruin his hotel. I didn't mean to ruin his trip. I thought it's, that's a pretty basic. When someone says I got the best chiropractor in the world, and you say, how do you know? They don't really know that. Have they really gone out? Hey, I went and visited 50 different chiropractors and this one was by the part of it. How do you know they're the best? How do you know you have the best plumber in the world? We don't know that, but people say I have the best broker. His argument was, well, because my broker calls me all the time with trades. Yeah, that's that's how he makes money. So it sounds like he's a really good broker at making him money, but maybe you should ask if he's making you money. Would that be a good question to ask? So. Do you want a surgeon that they're really good at making the surgeon money? Is that your goal for surgeons? I want a surgeon that has me in the operating room every week because that's how I know he's the best in the world. No, that's not how we look at the world. So how do you know? Well, you got to ask and see. The most basic thing is I could have gone to Vanguard and bought an index fund. Did he or she at least do as well as that? That would be a good place to start, wouldn't it? How many Americans do that? Almost none. Most Americans have no clue how their portfolio is doing. So, yeah, it's, it's a good question to ask. There are ways to do it. You can go versus an index. We, we look at the peers. How do they do it against the Lipper, Morningstar? You saw the stars, three, four, five star funds. Those are the kind of things you can look at. If you take my risk management class, we actually do por portfolio attribution, real basic portfolio attribution. So you can see how you grade a manager and how they're doing. Uh, <clears throat> All right, so let's say, you know what? I can't do it myself. I'm going to hire somebody to do it. This is the 1940 Act. So do you all know what mutual funds are? So I've heard of those. You've heard of ETFs. What's the difference between a mutual fund and ETF? There's really only one difference, really. A mutual fund is a trust that you buy into. It has a ticker. It trades like a stock, but you can only trade once a day at the, at the close. You can't trade during the day. An ETF is like a mutual fund that you can trade all day long. It has a ticker, but it looks more like a real stock. So uh, mutual funds, these are investment companies. They create trusts. These trusts get investors. Investors send money, and the trust invests all their money for them together. So if you're part of that trust, you're getting what everybody else in that trust is getting. 
Um, the big ones, the biggest one is BlackRock, Vanguard, Fidelity, T. Rowe Price, those type of companies, Victory Capital here locally. And they'll have some specific strategy, like we've already seen, large cap growth, small cap value, long-term corporate bonds, whatever strategy they have. They have some kind of strategy. When you do a mutual fund, you have to buy at the net asset value, at the closing net asset value. Now, you don't know what that is until probably about 5, 30, 6 o'clock at night because they have to do what they call strike the NAV. So the market closes, they look at their entire portfolio and they start pricing things up and they give you a price for that mutual fund. But you won't know. So if you bought a mutual fund at 258, you don't know how many shares you're gonna get because you know what the price is. And you can get fractional shares. So you might get 28.62934. It might go out actually 20 decimal places, who knows. But what you do is you don't actually buy shares. What you do is you buy dollar amounts. So you say, I want $5,000 of this. And they'll take your $5,000 divided by the NAV and that's how many shares you have, all right? If you're buying, that's what you get. If you're selling the same, it's the same thing. If you're selling, they have to, sorry. They have to figure out the NAV so they don't know how much, how many shares you're selling. Or you just say, sell everything. 